name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. Last week, we heard how Jesus' evangelism manual is one with just a few basic strategies that he'll use to build his church. And you'll remember those were simplicity, stability, and faithfulness. And we drew those out of our gospel lesson last week. And today, that conversation with, between Jesus and the Twelve continues. So we know that Jesus is sending his disciples out to, so, so that his kingdom will grow and give life to the world. But as Jesus describes what the disciples should expect, it seems like something that's life-ending rather than life-giving. But we had already started to see that last week, that stability, simplicity, and faithfulness lead the church right into trouble. Jesus doesn't hide the fact that the disciples are going to be persecuted for living and preaching and teaching as he does. The devil's going to set his sights on them. But then Jesus this week ups the ante, adding that even those closest to them, their families, their friends, might reject them and deliver them over to death. So that begs the question, why is ministry with Jesus so dangerous and destructive? Why does his gospel divide and ruin families? Shouldn't Jesus just make Christianity less scary and a little nicer and friendlier so that everyone wants to join? Well, there are certainly Christians who have done that. Many churches have tried to make Jesus easier to handle. They've gone the way of the world and embraced that which is mainstream and attractive. And in doing that, they, they've really already tossed out everything that we discussed last week. In their hankering for bigness, they sought abundance rather than simplicity. They embraced constant change instead of the stability of God's word. And their allegiances are clearly to something else instead of remaining faithful to Christ. And if we're honest with each other, with his piercing truths and rigorous life, Jesus is a lot more tolerable when you only let him say what you want to hear, that which is nice and safe and friendly. And we as individuals are tempted to live that way too. We shy away from the parts of Christianity that make life tough. We'd rather enjoy the pleasures of this world, the comfort of wealth and, companion, and the companionship of family and friends. But Jesus challenges that worldly program for life with his simplicity, stability, and faithfulness. And it really is an otherworldly life that he's calling us to. But what that means is that he and his followers will be met with hostility because he's offering an alternative way of existence, an alternative to the way the world has always preferred. But this difficult life with its rewards that we really can't see, that's nonetheless what he's called us to. So how do we endure such a rugged and rigorous Christianity? And what comfort and confidence can we have in this otherworldly life? And the key, I think, is in these words of Jesus today. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his Lord. To endure, we must imitate Christ. Now, we hear the word imitate and think that we have, that means we as disciples have to strive to imitate, to, to be exactly like him. So that means we have to embrace poverty like he did or challenge the temptations and assaults of the devil out in the wilderness like he did or commit ourselves to fulfilling the commandments like he did. But that's not what Jesus is advocating here. He's not telling the disciples that they have to go out and seek persecution that's going to come no matter what he says you will struggle and suffer for the faith and you'll even have the freedom to give it all up if you want but if you persist god is going to use these moments of struggle and weakness to form you in his image 
By allowing our faith to be challenged, Jesus is making us disciples to be like him, our teacher. He's shaping us servants to become like our Lord. So essentially, that imitation of Christ is being imposed on us if we're going to follow him. And really, that sounds like a pretty bad deal. Why does Jesus have to make us suffer to follow him? Well, we're going to suffer no matter what in the world anyways. But Jesus initiates his disciples onto his way of suffering, his path, because he knows where that path ends and that he's the one leading them there. He isn't guiding the disciples into anything that he himself won't experience. To become like the teacher, to become like the Lord, is to follow his cruciform path all the way to the cross. Jesus himself didn't go out seeking pain and suffering and death. And truly, he didn't deserve it. We, in our sinfulness, are constantly deserving the suffering that we bring on ourselves. But he suffered freely for our sake. And on the cross, he suffered the punishment we deserve so that we might have forgiveness and life. That's his promise to us. The promise is that we know that the path of suffering doesn't end in more suffering and death, but instead it leads us beyond to ever more life. And Paul captures this beautifully when he speaks to Timothy. He says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, He will deny us, but if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And that is where our confidence comes from, that Christ has faithfully pioneered our faith. He's blazed the trail to the cross so that we can follow along it and then reign there with him. So in this, we see that simplicity, stability, and faithfulness aren't just Jesus' instructions for us. They're his way of life, too. And they all find their perfection in the cross. If you think about it, despite its deadly simplicity, from the cross, we have life in abundance. Despite its destructive appearance, it grants us stability. And even though it proclaims a clear rejection from the world, From it, we have power to remain faithful. The cross stands steady as the world turns, and it bids us come forward fearlessly and with great hope in Christ. Now, the world rightly fears what Christ has accomplished because his word exposes the manipulation and corruption that they embrace. Nothing is covered that won't be revealed, says Jesus. Nothing is hidden that won't be known. Christ calls a thing what it is. He sees how we exploit and calls us to repentance. He reveals sin and corruption because he's paid the price for them. He doesn't hide suffering because he has already endured it for us. And by doing this, he takes away the power that the world thinks it has in making us suffer, and he uses it for his own good. That's why the world seeks to destroy the gospel of Christ, because he puts to death their lies and deception. We, on the other hand, as faithful Christians, can welcome his truthfulness. His honesty about our sinfulness is necessary because it drives us to repentance and makes us more dependent on him. By confessing our sins, we're freed from sin. We're freed from the devil's clutches and then embraced by Christ. And as we confess our sins, we're also confessing him as Lord and God. And just as Jesus promises, those who confess him before men, he also will confess before his Father in heaven. So as he draws us into the life of the cross, with its suffering and weakness, 
we confess him as our strength and stability. And we know that he'll remain faithful to us and lead us through until we stand in glory before our Father. It took time for the twelve to realize this, that their witnessing to Christ would ultimately lead to death, to the death of the cross. But we, who are on this side of the resurrection, know that that's where all true evangelism takes us. It doesn't lead us to, more num- to bigger numbers or fancier programs. Instead, it leads us to Christ's death on the cross. And yet, his death gives life. And that's the message he tells us in the dark that we as the church are to proclaim in the light. That's what he's whispered to us that we proclaim from the housetops. And we can do this fearlessly. No matter what the forces of this world might threaten us with, they might destroy our bodies, our homes, and our livelihoods. But in the end, they have no power over us. They can't destroy the soul which God has revived with his Holy Spirit. And they certainly cannot prevail and will not prevail against Christ and his church, which will endure until Christ comes again in glory. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Amen.